everyone. In this video, we're going to start talking about universalistic forms of ethical theories. Now, universalistic theories are theories wherein its claimants say morality applies to everyone equally. It's not relative to what somebody has said. It's the same for everyone, and everyone has equal access to the same kind of morality. Now, there are a couple different theories here. There's natural law theory, there's rights ethics, there's ethical egoism, there's utilitarianism, there's deontology. Here in this video, I'm going to talk about natural law theory. So natural law is a theory that says what good is, is whether or not something is being used in accordance with its end, purpose, or goal. You do that, you're doing something good. You're not doing that, you're doing something bad. Let's get into it. Natural law ethics is also based on Aristotle to some degree. A lot of it in the Western tradition is developed by Thomas Aquinas, who himself was an Aristotelian. So let's take a look at the particulars of this view. Generally speaking, it's the notion that what is good or right is embedded in nature itself and can be apprehended with the use of reason. So a couple of key claims. For theists, God is the creator of morality. But these subsequent claims one could still affirm without being a theist or a believer in God. Morality is found in unchanging principles of moral natural law in nature. Natural law is universal and applies to all humans at all times. Humans can access natural law via the use of reason, and man-made laws are authoritative only insofar as they are just and consistent with the principles of natural law. At first, you might be thinking, this sounds like divine command theory again. It's not. Divine command theory said that whatever God says is good because he says it. This is saying that there is natural law that's just there and it's unchanging. It's not there because God says so. It's part of the cosmic order itself. And it's true for everyone. It's not just because God says so. And it's not just because God says it to me. Morality is always the same at all times and in all places. What is good is the same at all times and all places across the universe. Now here in Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, he summarizes what the natural law is. Hence... This is the first precept of law, that good is to be done and pursued, and evil is to be avoided. Do good, don't do evil. That's the starting principle. All other precepts of the natural law are based upon this. So before we get into the actual reading of Thomas Aquinas, let's take a look at his method, which is called the Scholastic Method. And basically, if you wrote an essay in high school, this is the ancestor of that kind of methodology, where there's an introduction, some body paragraphs, a conclusion. But when you're reading Thomas, sometimes it can be difficult to figure out, is he saying this? Like, is this his opinion? Is this his point of view? So let's break down what his method is, so that way when we're going and looking at the text, it'll make more sense. So Thomas always starts initially with a question. He'll say, this is the thing that I want to investigate. And it's usually a question couched in the positive. For example, in the Summa Theologiae, he says, whether God exists, that's a question. Then he moves on to objections. So he lists reasons, not that he believes, but that someone might say to deny deny the positive answer to the question. So when he's talking about does God exist, he lists reasons why someone might say God does not exist. Then he says what's called the contrario or an on the contrary. What he does in the contrary is he cites some authoritative source that would immediately object to the objections. So sometimes it might be something from philosophy, it might be Aristotle, it might be might be Plato, might be something from sometimes even the Christian scriptures themselves saying eh, that the objections are off on that point. And then he does his responsio, or the I answer that. And there, in the I answer that, that is where Thomas is telling you exactly what he thinks. So for our purposes, that's going to be the most important. So when you're reading the objections, that's not really Thomas's view. That's him coming up with what an opponent might say to his view. And then finally, he replies to the objections where he says, the objections that I listed above, here's what I would specifically say to those particular objections. That being said, let's take a look where he actually talks about the natural law. First off in the section on natural law, he breaks it down to six questions that he previews for us. He says what the natural law is, what the precepts of the natural law are, whether all virtuous acts belong to the natural law, whether the natural law is the same for all men, whether it's mutable, that is, can it change over time, and whether it can be deleted from the mind of man. Of course, he always says man rather than say humanity. And he gets at this with a few subsidiary questions. So first of all, he wants to ask the question, is this a habit? Is natural law something that we just do? And again, as I said before, he lists the objections. Then he says his on the contrary. In this case, it's from Augustine. And then he gets to his responsio, where he tells us what he thinks about it. And he says 
there's really two ways of thinking about a habit. One way he says is in its essence, and he says in one sense, it's not a habit. It's not something, it's not just that we regularly do stuff that we say it's natural law. But if there is a principle on which you continually act, in that sense, it is a habit. But it's not a habit in the same sense as virtue ethics was for Aristotle. It's not simply the cultivating of virtue simply by what we do. Here, there's something else higher and above going on. Eventually, in Article 4, he asks this question, which is important for us. Whether the natural law is the same in all men, or is the natural law in the same for every human being? And this is what makes natural law a universalistic theory of ethics. Different from what we were talking about before with subjectivism, cultural relativism, and divine command theory. There, ethics is relative to what somebody has said, whether that be the individual person, and it might be in their own mind, it might not be something they actually vocalized, or the culture, or to God's decree. Here, even though some might consider natural law a religious perspective, it's not reducible to simply doing the commands that God has said or commanded. Here, it's something that God has placed in creation. At least from Thomas's point of view, there are forms of natural law which might not even be necessarily theistic, but it applies to everybody. So he's asking the question here, is the natural law the same for everybody? Let's get to his responsio. And what he says here is that it is a property of man to be inclined or to act according to reason. So then, in speculative matters, truth is the same in all men, both as to principles and as to conclusions, although truth is not known to all as regards the conclusions, but only in regards the principles which are common, called common conception. In matters of action, however, truth or practical rightness is not the same for all as to matters of detail, but only as to general principles, and where there is the same rightness in matters of detail, it is not equally known to all. That is to say, this is kind of hard to figure out, and the particulars are different, circumstances are different to everyone, but the principles are always the same for everyone. And he says that here in the subsequent paragraph. It is clear then that as regards the general principles of reason, whether speculative or practical, truth or rightness is the same for all men and is equally known to all. So maybe what do I specifically do in this situation? That might be a difficult question to answer, but the principles are the same for everybody. The basics of what we're supposed to do, that never changes. Which is why he says, as to the particular conclusions of speculative reason, the truth is the same of all, for all men, but is not equally known to all. That's why he says here, for example, it's true that the three angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles. What he's saying there is if you add up all the degrees of the angles inside of a triangle, it's 180 degrees. That's true for everybody. Even if you don't know geometry, that's still true for you. Then Article 5, can the natural law be changed? Now he says, nothing prohibits the natural law from being changed. For many things advantageous to human life have been added over and above the natural law, both by divine law and human laws. Like you can add to it specifics. If you have prohibitions against murder, you know that murder is wrong according to the natural law using your reason. You can understand the end of human beings is to live. We can have particular human laws that prohibit murder in specific circumstances, adding to the specifics. This is murder that you did here, and that's wrong because we already know that from a natural law principle. But he also concludes, in this sense, the natural law is entirely immutable as to its first principles. So on a fundamental level, the Natural law does not change, it's eternal, it's always the same, even though the particulars of how we work it out in our lives, that stuff may change. But what this means is morality is permanent, according to natural law. Nothing really changes on a fundamental level. That's very different from, say, cultural relativism or divine command. Maybe the culture changes its view. Maybe God changes his mind, it says one thing and then says something else. Natural law theory, according to Thomas here, says morality is always the same. That doesn't change. Our understanding of it might change, where something that we didn't realize was wrong was always wrong, and we go, oh, according to natural law, if we really think about it, this has always been wrong. And I'm going to go ahead and say here, we'll see this work out when we get to rights ethics, which is a different theory of ethics altogether, but it is certainly derived from natural law. So the natural law is this notion that morality is embedded in creation. It's embedded in the universe itself. And if we just think hard enough and we use our reason, we can ascertain what it is. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Aristotle introduced the notion of teleology. Knowing what something is, is knowing what it's for. Thomas says we're able to figure out if some things are good or not in accordance with natural law by figuring out is this thing being used in accordance with its end? Am I using it for what it's for? The pen is for writing. I'm writing stuff down. That's a good act. I can use my reason to figure out this is what it's for, and I'm using it for what it's for. 
therefore it's good. On the other hand, if I use the pen for something that it's not for, like trying to play it as a flute or something, that's not what it's for, and it's out of accordance with natural law. That might be the wrong thing to do. So consider how natural law, based on what I just described, applies in the following situations. Consider this, what are reproductive organs for? Well, if you want to talk about it from a teleological perspective, they're for reproduction. Hence, Thomas and natural law theorists would say, if you use reproductive organs for activities that are not reproductive, that is unnatural, which for natural law theorists is the same thing as saying that it's wrong. That would mean masturbation or any kinds of non-reproductive sexual activity would be unnatural and wrong because those organs are being used out of accordance with their purpose. Also, this comes up in abortion as well. If the end or telos or purpose of a fetus is to grow, then once conception happens, it's the natural order of things for that fetus to progress. And therefore, the use of abortifacents or, or getting an abortion is out of accordance with the natural order as well because it's out of accordance of the aim. The purpose of life is to grow. Stopping life from growing would be out of accordance with the natural law. That's also why homicide would be out of accordance with the natural law. The purpose of people is to live, and if you kill them, they can't do that. Now, another aspect of the natural law that persists to this day is the notion of just war theory. So in that same work, Summa Theologiae, Thomas talks about the notion of a just war, and he gives some principles to guide us as to what makes war good that are in accordance with natural law. Now, these notions of a just war in natural law persist today in international affairs, and also come up with ethical concerns in the manufacturing of certain weapons, whether they be nuclear, biological, or even conventional. The ethics here would even include stuff like about drone attacks. Here's the principles for a just war. Who can declare war? Who can go to war? Not just anybody. I can't just decide to go to war with my neighbor. Principle number one, war has to be waged by a legitimate authority. It can't just be anyone. For it's not the business of a private individual to declare war. You can go to court. You have a problem with your neighbor, you can go to court. You can sue. You don't have to go, I declare war on your neighbor. Moreover, it's not the business of a private individual to summon together the people. You can't call up the militia. And, as the care of the commonweal, or as we would say today, the commonwealth, is committed to those who are in authority, it is their business to watch over the commonweal of the city, kingdom, or province subject to them. What this means is that it's the job of rulers to make sure that their people are protected, preserved, and defended. So you as a private individual shouldn't have to be worry about going to war with your neighbor, because the people in charge should be taking care of it if there's a problem. Principle number two, a just cause is required, namely that those who are attacked should be attacked because they deserve it on account of some fault. So, in a just war, you can't just decide to declare a war on somebody because you want to. There has to be a reason for it, and he gives us a list. A just war is want to be described as one that avenges wrongs, so it has to fix some sort of problem. When a nation or state has to be punished, so some nation has done something bad and that needs to be rectified and pushed back. For refusing to make amends for wrongs inflicted by its subjects, the people of a country keep attacking others, and so other countries warn them, if you keep doing this, we're going to do something about it, and to restore what has been seized unjustly. So it's wrong to just go in and take other people's stuff. Third aspect. It is necessary that the belligerents, that is, the people going to war, should have a rightful intention, so that they intend the advancement of good or the avoidance of evil. He quotes Augustine here, The passion for inflicting harm, the cruel thirst for vengeance, an unpacific and relentless spirit, the fever of revolt, the lust of power, and such like things, all these are rightly condemned in war. If you're going to war, what are you there for? The advancement of good. The purpose of war is for peace. It's to... Fix the problems addressed in the second criteria for going to war, not merely to be something enjoyed for its own sake. The people that go into war need to go into it with an attitude of we are here to do good. Not, as he says, for motives of aggrandizement or cruelty, but with the object of securing peace. This gets collapsed into what you see here. These two separate notions of use ad bellum, what do you do before you go to war, and use in bello, how you should act during war. And so this is a checklist to see, do you have a just war? In summary, war must be declared and waged by legitimate authority. There must be a just cause for going to war. War must be the last resort. That means you can't just decide to go to war with somebody at the first sign of a problem. There must be a reasonable prospect of success, and the violence used must be proportional to the wrong being resisted. Oh, they sunk one of our boats. Let's nuke the whole country. 
No. And then also in war, non-combatants should not be intentionally targeted. The tactics used must be in proportion to the injury being redressed. And also, prisoners of war must be treated humanely. So if someone surrenders, you accept their surrender, and you are hospitable to them. Now this is just war theory, but just war theory is a part of natural law theory. And some of these rules end up manifesting themselves in the 20th century in, say, the Geneva Conventions or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But in order to make sense of the developments of the 20th century, we'll need to take a look at rights ethics, which I'll be covering in the next video. But before we get to that, I want to point out that even though we were looking at a medieval text here on natural law, Thomas Aquinas wrote in the 13th century, Natural law has not gone away. In fact, right now, there are two justices on the United States Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch and Clarence Thomas, who are self-avowedly natural law theorists. The way they come to their notions of legal jurisprudence is with a hermeneutic, or that is, an interpretive framework of natural law coming to the table in terms of how they interpret constitutional law and all the ethical and legal matters contained therein. So what I want to do now is take a look at a figure from the 20th century looking at natural law theory when it comes to sexual ethics. And so we're going to take a look at Elizabeth Anscombe. So Elizabeth Anscombe was a 20th century philosopher, and here we're looking at a piece of hers from 1975 called Contraception and Chastity, wherein she decries and strongly criticizes the sexual ethics coming out of the 1960s free love movement and the kinds of advantages that came through what is sometimes called the sexual revolution. So let's get right into it. She says, I will first ask you to contemplate a familiar point, the fantastic change that has come about in people's situation in respect of having children because of the invention of efficient contraceptives. You see, what can't be otherwise, we accept, and so we accept death and its unhappiness. But possibility destroys mere acceptance, and so it is with possibility of having intercourse and preventing conception. This power is now placed in a woman's hands. She needn't have children when she doesn't want to, and she can still have her man. This can make the former state of things look intolerable, so that one wonders why they were so pleased about weddings in former times, and why the wedding day was supposed to be such a fine day for the bride. So already, despite being a woman philosopher in the latter half of the 20th century, mind you, we're two years after, in the United States at least, Roe v. Wade and Dovey Bolton being decided by the United States Supreme Court at the time in which this was written, and also coming out of the 1960s, notice already what she's saying here. First of all, here, what can't be otherwise we accept. Like, we know we're going to die, nothing's stopping that, so we just deal with it. But possibility, the, the idea that we could change things, changes the fundamental nature of our lives. So now, another advent of the mid-20th century was contraception, wherein women could engage in sexual activity without the fear of becoming pregnant. This is new. This had never happened in history before. Yes, there are kinds of methods of contraception that existed in the past, but there was much more effective contraception introduced in the 20th century. Not only was it effective, it also became more acceptable and something women could simply go to their doctor and acquire. Now, in the mid-20th century, it wasn't e as easy to do that as it is now, but this is new. Whereas sexuality in the past was seen as always conducive to reproduction, that's its end from a natural law perspective. What's the purpose of sexuality? Reproduction. That's its function. Anscombe is already telling us, you see what's happened here? We have divorced an activity from its function. That's already what she's hinted at, and as you can see, she's not happy about it. Now let me say, as an aside here too, a little bit later on in the course, when we get to the stuff for Quiz 6, I'll be looking at some other perspectives from someone, like we'll look at Simone de Beauvoir and her feminist response to some of the stuff that Anscombe is saying in here in about the same time period in the 1960s and 70s. But I want you to pay attention to her argument here that she makes, where she makes a historical argument here and also brings in some natural law. So she says this, historically Christianity was at odds with the heathen world in the past, not only about various things that were considered bad in the past, fornication, infanticide, idolatry, but also about marriage. Christians were taught that husband and wife had equal rights in one another's bodies. A wife is wronged by her husband's adultery as well as a husband by his wife's. And Christianity involved a non-acceptance of the contemptible role of the female partner in fornication, calling the prostitute to repentance and repudiating respectable concubinage. So what she's getting at here is that what Christianity brought about is that there was actually a kind of equality in the marriage, perhaps not in the roles or the social roles that spouses have 
husbands are supposed to go out and work and women are supposed to stay at home. Yeah, sure, that stuff is traditional. What she is saying is that at least when it comes to sexual ethics, there's supposed to be in Christianity an equality of husbands and wives and the dignity that they owe each other. That's why she said there it's as wrong for the husband to go out and cheat as it is for the wife to go out and cheat. Whereas she says in the pagan world, sort of the husband's infidelity is often excused, whereas the woman is denigrated. And Christianity at least brought a kind of sexual equality when it came to that in marriage. That's why she says, In Christian teaching, a value is set on every human life and on men's chastity as well as on women's. And this is part of the ordinary calling of a Christian, not just in connection with the austerity of monks. Faithfulness by which a man turned only to his spouse, forswearing all other women, was counted as one of the great goods of marriage. But the quarrel is far greater between Christianity and the present-day heathen, post-Christian morality, that has sprung up as a result of contraception. In one word, Christianity taught that men ought to be as chaste as pagans thought honest women ought to be. The contraceptive morality teaches that women need to be as little chaste as pagans thought men need to be. What she's getting at is this. In Christianity, it was thought that men and women are to be equal, equally chaste with each other. So in marriage, you don't go off and commit adultery, fornication, so forth. But what modern morality, she says, has done, post-Christian morality, divorced from the natural law has done, has actually caused everyone, including women, to be encouraged to be unchaste, to engage in sexual activity divorced sometimes from marriage itself and certainly from reproduction. And listen what she says here to that end. And if there is nothing intrinsically wrong with contraceptive intercourse, and if it could become general practice everywhere when there is intercourse but ought to be no begetting, that is producing offspring, then it's very difficult to see the objection to this morality, for the ground of objection to fornication and adultery was that sexual intercourse is only right in the sort of setup that typically provides children with a father and mother to care for them. If you can turn intercourse into something other than the reproductive type of act, I don't mean, of course, that every act is reproductive any more than every acorn leads to an oak tree, but it's the reproductive type of act. Just as an aside, what she's saying here is, yeah, not every seed you plant in the ground produces plants, but that's the purpose of putting seeds in the ground. Then why, if you can change it, should it be restricted to the married? Restricted, that is, to partners bound in a formal legal union whose fundamental purpose is the bringing up of children. What she's getting at here is, initially, contraception was only legally allowed for married couples. Well, she's saying here, well, if it's okay for married couples to have contraception put off the raising of offspring, or as she puts it, begetting, who cares? Because shouldn't it be something that everybody is going to celebrate and be allowed to do? And in this case, she's right, at least in terms of the extension of its permissibility this does actually happen, where you don't have to be married to go get contraception today. For if that is not its fundamental purpose, there is no reason why, for example, marriage should have to be between people of opposite sexes. If the purpose of marriage is to produce offspring, but we're doing things that are meant to get rid of offspring, who cares about whether or not marriage should be between opposite sexes? Now, she is in a traditional position here, arguing this point, that if the purpose and function according to natural law, is that marriage is to be between opposite sexes for the production of offspring. Anything that deviates from that end, from that telos, from that purpose, would therefore be unnatural and wrong. So, marriage between the opposite sexes, can they naturally produce offspring? No. So from a natural law perspective, at least according to Anscombe, that would be immoral and wrong. Furthermore, engaging in sexual activity without even the slightest inclination towards the production of offspring, since according to Anscombe's theory of natural law, that's its purpose, would be unnatural and immoral and wrong. And so let me say here, where natural law comes up today is in traditionalist defenses often of cisgendered, heterosexual, monogamous marriages, and that anything that deviates from that is out of accordance with the natural law. And that's where it usually gets brought up today with natural law defenses of what might be called traditional, but when they're being called traditional, they need not necessarily... And so that's often how natural law gets employed today, defenses of traditional marriage. Traditional, again, meaning here, cisgendered, heterosexual, monogamous marriages. Now she says, wait a minute, people pick on natural law only talking about this stuff, but she says natural law is not just relegated to those things. She says here, in fact, there's no greater connection of natural law with the prohibition on contraception than with any other part of morality. Any type of wrong action is against the natural law. Stealing is. Framing someone is. 
oppressing people is. Natural law is simply a way of speaking about the whole of morality used by Catholic thinkers, like Thomas Aquinas, because they believe the general precepts of morality are laws promulgated by God our Creator in the enlightened human understanding when it is thinking in general terms about what are good and bad actions. Notice she did not say there it's what God commands, it's that what God has put into nature, what he has promulgated that is accessible to us via our use of reason. Further, that is to say, the discoveries of reflection and reasoning when we think straight about these things are God's legislation to us, whether we realize this or not. So she is not saying here that these so-called traditional ethical views are something that simply comes directly out of scripture. It's not the commands of God. This is something that everybody using their reason would know. Know what? That if you understand the end of an action, the goodness of what we do is tethered to the end of that action. So for example, murder is a violation of the natural law because the end of human beings is to live. And Anscombe would say here, people wouldn't make a big fuss about that. Everybody would agree with that. And that's something that we know via reason. Similarly, she would say, any deviation from heteronormative cisgendered sexuality would also be an unnatural deviation. And we know it via our use of reason and our reason of attaching, our reason of assessing a particular action in accordance with its end. The function of sexual activity, the purpose of reproductive organs is to reproduce. So that's heteronormative cisgendered sexuality, but also it's to happen within the context of a marriage because a marriage produces an environment wherein that reproduction can be facilitated by parents. It's not merely the begetting of offspring or producing offspring and just leaving them in the world, but to take care of them, to nurture them, and to inculcate values, to be parents. So if we're engaging in sexual activity where that end is not even on the table, that is irrational, that is unnatural, and that's immoral according to Ansco. And so based on what I've talked about, that's why she says here on page 123 earlier in the piece, against the background of a society with that morality, being the post-Christian non-natural law morality, more and more people will have intercourse with little feeling of responsibility, little restraint, and yet they just won't be so careful about always using contraceptives. And so the widespread use of contraceptives naturally leads to more and more rather than less and less abortion. Indeed, abortion is now being recommended as a population control measure, a second line of defense. So listen to her argument here. She's saying this, really, you'd think the purpose of contraception supposedly is that fewer and fewer people would get pregnant. That's the point. But actually, the availability of contraception will just allow more people to be sexually promiscuous. And as a result, despite the fact that contraception exists, for preventing even pregnancy, not just the usage of abortifacents, but preventing pregnancy from happening in the first place, such as with the use of condoms or orthotricycline or something like that. She says that will create a new moral attitude wherein people will engage in more sexual activity, but they won't be as careful as they would have been under the old morality. Thus, it will result in more abortions, which preventative contraception should itself be trying to prevent in the first place. In other words, she's saying this is going to result in a moral disaster and it will result in more abortion in the long run. The lackadaisical use of contraception or the absence of contraception will actually cause more sexual problems, more societal problems, familial problems, and more people will be pregnant, unfortunately, under this new morality which celebrates contraception than would be before, at least she so argues. So in summary, natural law theory is the view that what we're supposed to do, or the principles thereof, are embedded in nature itself, and we can access the principles via our use of reason, which every human being possesses, which is what makes it universalistic. And basically the way the principle works out is you're able to determine using reason what, whether or not something is good if it's being used in accordance with its end or purpose. This can go from rather benign, banal subjects, like the purpose of a pen is not to throw it at somebody, but to write with it, to the purpose of reproductive organs is not to have fun or pleasure, but to reproduce. And therefore, natural law is a very controversial theory today, especially in its defenses of traditional sexuality, heteronormativity, cisgenderism, and the denigration 
of homosexuality, transgenderism, or what natural law theorists would consider deviant forms of sexuality. Despite that, though, natural law is still the fundamental basis of a lot of international law theory that we saw in Thomas Aquinas's Just War Theory, and that tradition continues to the present day relatively unquestioned. Furthermore, as we'll see when I talk about rights ethics next time, the notion of human rights is something that actually comes out of natural law theory and evolves and develops into another theory called natural rights or rights ethics. And some of those notions of rights and defenses of rights have actually been appropriated by progressives as opposed to the traditionalists like we were talking about earlier. So the usage of natural law is not necessarily intrinsically conservative. And for example, just as a preview, we'll see when we get to when we're talking about rights ethics and we talk about Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King decries segregation as being out of accordance with the natural law and even quotes Thomas Aquinas. But we'll see that next time. So coming up, we'll continue our universalistic theories by talking about rights ethics. Then we'll get to ethical egoism. That'll be quiz four stuff. Then we'll look at utilitarianism. That'll be quiz five. And then we'll look at deontology and other approaches. That'll be quiz six. But that's what's coming up.